we greet our friends everywhere with chapter 23 of This Is My Song, the story of Fanny Crosby. This is another in the series, Stories of Great Christians, and comes to you from the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. For many months, Fanny Crosby lived with her relatives in New England. Here she worked on her poems and a few hymns. To the children of the Jackson home, she was indeed a blessing. They'd never known anyone like her before, and they were enchanted as she told them the stories of her hymns, stories of her life in New York, of kind Mr. Bigelow, W.H. Doan, who would be called nothing but W.H., and of her husband, Van. She spent hours with these children, and by reading to them and teaching them, Fanny was quite amazed to realize that her life was by no means finished. There were still people who needed and wanted her. Her home in New England needed what she could contribute. To the children, little Jonathan, Margaret, Seward, and their friends, Fanny was once more a useful member of the family. Fanny spent hours with them, talking and reading, as her own grandmother had done years before. And the children loved it. Read us more, Aunt Fanny. I've never heard a story about a mouse before. I wish I could really read you entire story, Seward. But I can't. I can only tell you what I've memorized. You must have memorized an awful lot. (laughs) Quite a lot, Jonathan. Do you know any more stories about mice? Mm, I'm afraid not, Seward. The only one I know is the poem I've given you by Robert Burns. But I do know one about a louse. A bug? Only one verse, I'm afraid, but it's the most important one. You'll learn something from it. Oh, boy, tell us about this louse, Aunt Fanny. Well, it goes something like this, Jonathan. Oh, would some power the gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. It would fry money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lee us and e'en devotion. That's not about a louse. Oh, the entire poem is about a louse. A louse as seen on a lady's bonnet. And the lady's proud and don't know it. And yet if she could see herself, she wouldn't be so proud. Right you are, Seward. There's a lot of people who wouldn't be so proud of if they could only see themselves as others see them. I guess I didn't understand that one so well, Aunt Fanny. Tell us some more. All right, Jonathan. Another verse from another poem by Robert Burns. You'll understand this one, my dear. What's the name of this poem, Aunt Fanny? The Cotter's Saturday Night. The father, much like your father, kneels down with his family to give thanks to the Lord. Then, kneeling down to heaven's eternal king, the saint, the father, and the husband prays. Hope springs exulting on triumphant wing, that thus they all shall meet in future days. There ever bask in uncreated rays, no more to sigh or shed the bitter tear. Together, hymning their Creator's praise, in such society yet still more dear, while circling time moves round in an eternal sphere. I like that one. It's like one of your hymns. Man, I understand it. When I grow up, I'm going to be like you say, Aunt Fanny. When I have a family, I'm going to teach them about God. Yes, Jonathan, that's very important. Say, we promised Mom we'd pick some flowers for. Do you mind, Aunt Fanny? Oh, of course not. You just go ahead and pick them. I'll wait right here for you. Oh, good. Come on, Jonathan. You help. All right. (laughs) And I thought I was coming to New England to die. 
Instead, I find myself in the midst of youth, teaching them and loving them. Oh, my life has been good. Even now, I find contentment. But her age was telling on her, and it became necessary for Fanny to leave the Jackson family and establish a home of her own with a friend, Mrs. Booth. But every year, for months at a time, she'd go back to the Jacksons to live with them and the children and to be called Aunt Fanny, something which she cherished a great deal. And then, at 92 years of age, a special reception was held for her in her home city of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Following this reception... Fanny was invited to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she met several of the faculty of Harvard University. Fanny was always eager for a new experience, even at 92, and so she set out with her companion for Cambridge. On reaching Back Bay Station, a taxi met them, and the good Scotch minister who invited her took Fanny up in his arms and landed her safely in a cushioned seat. (laughs) Now, Fanny Crosby, you've arrived in Boston. You've nothing to think about, only to have a good time. I'm afraid I'm not quite myself. Was the trip tiring? Goodness me, I was too excited to find out. In the days that followed, Fanny was asked to speak in the church at the college, and she readily agreed. But she was too surprised to even think straight when the first night arrived. They're here. They're here, Mrs. Booth. Is Fanny ready? She's been ready for an hour. Do you think you could walk from the house to the church? It's only a little way. My dear man, what gives you the impression that I can't? We'll walk together. Fine. Then come along. They're waiting for you. Who's waiting for who? (laughs) You'll find out. Uh, Here, I'll open the door. It sounds like a crowd. Oh, Fanny. Fanny, if only you could see. What is it? What is it? A band. A big band. And people all over. Hundreds of them. Well, what are, are they doing here? They're here to escort you to the church, Fanny Crosby. They're here to honor you. Me? All right. Are you ready? Yes. Then take my arm. And as we walk, Fanny, I'll tell you about these people. Their faces happy. Some tears, but not many. And they'll sing for you, Fanny. For the woman who's given them hymns which they understand. Poetry with a message. As they went along, Fanny was told that 2,000 people were present, present to honor her, and she was to speak to them. This, this was too much happiness for one elderly lady. And when the time came and Mrs. Booth led Fanny to the platform, she began her speech. My dear friends, I am happy to greet you here tonight. I have so much I should like to tell you, yet so little time. My simple trust in God's goodness has never failed me during all my long life. The Lord has truly been my good shepherd and has never permitted me to want. For goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Faith supplies me with good gifts. And my entire life has been an example of these lines. Trust on as clouds of evening glide away and leave the calm reflection of the day. 
Soon shall thy waiting eyes his glory see, and though through clouds it come, so let it be. Fanny spoke again in the church the following night, and the next evening the Locus Musical Group gave her a reception. It was a lot of excitement for Fanny. Yet her wonderful constitution stood up well, and she loved it all. Fanny Crosby, you bear up well under so many ovations. We are proud to have you in Boston. Everyone has been very pleasant to me. I feel quite at home. We are glad you like us. Boston people can't help being nice. I beg your pardon. I'm a New Englander myself. I love the strength and habits of its people. You'll never know how honored I am at having such splendid people do all this for me. You deserve the best. Excuse me, please, but I have more news for you, Fanny. What now? Tomorrow evening, you're going to visit with a number of our Harvard professors. Perhaps you'd like to get to bed early tonight. I'm going to visit with Harvard professors. Are you sure? Several of the professors have expressed a desire to meet you, Fanny. They're coming to visit you tomorrow. Well, I shall certainly have to put on my best bib and tucker. Did you pack my green silk, Mrs. Booth? It's all ready for you. Mm, Harvard professors. Yes, seeking to honor you, Fanny. Mm, perhaps I had best retire. For tomorrow, I must put on my finest behavior, and I must be sure to look as wise as Aristotle. I'll get your coat, Francis Jane Crosby. Tomorrow, you meet the Harvard professors. My my! Oh, they can't be doing all this for me. Not for me, a, a mere hymn writer. <laughs> A mere hymn writer, you say, my dear Fanny. I never dreamed you could be this modest. The professors are honoring you for what you've done in this world, what you've contributed to our nation. Your hymns will live forever, and whenever they're heard, some soul will find the peace and the faith that you have in your heart. Oh, stop it at once! I'm sorry. Is is anything wrong? Yes. I fear I shall cry, and I mustn't do that. I could never visit with the Harvard professors if my eyes were red. It was all much honor, much glory. But Fanny accepted it with the humility that comes with old age. She took the praise as from the Lord, and maintained that she would have accomplished nothing without the Lord to guide her. So we conclude chapter 24 of "This Is My Song," the story of Fanny Crosby. This is another in the series "Stories of Great Christians," and comes to you from the radio studios of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. <laughs>